All right, let me try the slideshow and turning off the presenter view. All right, how's that look for everyone? All right, cool. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Jacob Hiles, the Group 1 Operations Officer. I have a senior rating in uh, Emergency Services, and I am also a Hawk Mountain Ranger. It's Air Force C-130 pilot on the side. Cap's really my full-time job. So, All right, I'm going to go over a couple things for the very beginning uh, member of any emergency services. We're assuming you all went and got your CAP test 116 knocked out after uh, Monday. Now you're trying to figure out what to do next. So this is a brief I originally built for the Scott Compadre Squadron. I'm also the squadron commander down there. So I got some pictures from our past, some FTXs we did, and some from, I think these are the 70s. Some of these, uh, found some stuff in the history box. All right, we're gonna talk about cover some terms and definitions to make sure everyone knows what I'm talking about when I reference something. Talk about the couple of the, the four different tracks you can go into, uh, show you where to find the training materials, and we're gonna talk about e-services. Once that's done, we'll go into a little bit more detail in ops quals, and then I might even talk about Wimmers a little bit, um, depending on how much time we have. All right, first off, you'll hear people talk about your one-on-one -on -one card a lot. That is your CAP Form 101. It is the Silver Patrol Specialty Qualification Card. It shows what specialties you have, uh, which ones you're a trainee in, which ones you're qualified to evaluate on. If you have a CAP driver's license, it'll show that and what uh, vehicles you are allowed to drive. And if you've uploaded your physical properties and picture properly, it'll show all that stuff. So I encourage once you join, um, get a uh, approved picture uploaded into um, e-services right away. Next up, if you're going to be in Seal Air Patrol for any length of time, uh, like some of us have been in 20, 30, 40 years, you want to maintain a CAT Form 114. This is your emergency services qualification record. It's where you're going to want to keep track of your actual missions, your training missions, schools, things like that. When it comes to um, getting ribbons for emergency services, and we'll cover that a little bit later, this is a great resource so you can remember which missions you're on as so you don't have to go digging through Wimmers to find it. All right, operations qualifications referred to as ops quals. It's the section of e-services where you can upload your supporting documents, track your training, and submit your training to sign off. So that's what everyone wants to know. They want to know how I get credit for what I just learned. And that's where you do it. The SQTR, the squitter, is the specialty qualification training record. This is a form. It can be either electronic, and it generally is nowadays, or it could be a sheet of paper you carry around in your pocket. So use the track individual tasks in an emergency services specialty. So there's a squitter for every specialty and you have to get it completely filled out before you uh, get approved. All right, so this is what a one-on-one card looks like. It's greatly expanded from my very first one-on-one card. It had, I think, 26 items on it. And now you can see you've got two giant columns of items. So first off, like I said, it has your picture if you have that uploaded as well as your characteristics. It's gonna have your name, your charter number and your cap ID. That's the front side. And if you have a super high speed resource unit leader, they'll have a, um, a barcode reader. So you can just use your one-on-one card to scan in into a mission, make it a little bit easier. All right, moving on to the second column. There is a key here and tell you what all the little symbols next to your uh, qualifications mean. So the infinity symbol says it doesn't expire and that generally applies to your general merge services. That's that and your instant command system and independent study courses and I cut. Those are the ones that don't expire. You also notice there's a couple other on there. Uh, points of distribution center, that is a, a course. So it doesn't expire. Uh, the alerting officer ones, they don't expire either. All right, the diamond, that means you're a skills evaluator. This is important if um, the resource unit leader is trying to figure out who can be an evaluator for certain tasks. They can take a look at all the diamonds, figure that out. You are a trainee if you have one single asterisk. Uh, the double asterisk means NIMS training incomplete. I've never seen that. Uh, Kirk, have you ever seen that before on a one-on-one card, the double asterisk? I don't believe I ever have, no. Yeah, I've never seen that. I've also never seen the aircraft ground handling incomplete. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> but 
technically they're out there. Moving to the bottom of that has the driver's license. So it says, yes, I do have a cap driver's license and it's going to expire in uh, two and a half years. It has expiration date at the end. Now these little numbers in the middle that tells you the person looking at what vehicles I can drive. So go down to the bottom of the next two columns and they have the abbreviations for those uh, vehicles. All right, so at some point I got uh, permission to tow a trailer even though I haven't done the tow test. So usually if you're going to have the towing on your card, you need to have done a tow test with the uh, wing uh, transportation officer. In Illinois, we don't have any special purpose vehicles. So when you're putting that um, request in for license, don't bother checking that. And then it's going to show you what date it was printed. So when I built this slideshow, it was April 19th. All right, then in the next two columns, this gives you an idea of all the qualifications that are out there. So there's a lot to choose from. Don't try to do it all at once. A lot of this stuff, you have to start at the bottom and work your way up through the chain. So, but lots of options. All right, next is the CAP Form 114. I only recently, in the last couple of years, started using this once I realized that my um, senior member master record didn't have any more room to put training missions or anything on it, even though I built 200 pages for it. So. I went to this. All right, I'm gonna have to re-adjust my screen so you can all see this. All right, this is the Civil Air Patrol Emergency Service Qualification Record, the CAP Form 114. Going down the right-hand column, it has some identification information, name, rank, or name ID, and charter number. Then it lists all your specialties, when you became a trainee, and when you became qualified. The 101T issued, it's a little bit dated. We actually used to have a separate 101T training card many, many years ago. Uh, nowadays, like I said, it just shows you a little asterisk on your, your regular 101 card. The only time this would come into, come into use is if you want to take a good idea of when you're about to expire. You have two years to complete your training. So if you're reaching that part and you haven't finished it, you need, you need to get a move on. Now, the reason you might want to keep this is this is pretty much the only place you're going to know when you initially got qualified in something. Because once you get re renew, a or renew an item, eService is only going to show the most current date. So if you're trying to find out when you first got Ground Team 3 certified, this is the only place it's going to be. So if you don't write it down here, you're never going to know. So one page to keep track of all your stuff, and then several pages after that to put your mission number, duty assignment, number of sorties, whether you had a find, a save, and any remarks. So I tend to put in the remarks, I'll put uh, where it was at, things like that. Um, when you're getting ready for to try to qualify for your search find ribbon, this is a great resource. You're gonna list all your missions here. So several pages of this, and after a couple of years, it is gonna fill up. You might notice that two or four pages repeating. That's because I made copies of this in inserted more pages just to make it last longer for us old folks. And then the last page is blank. And you've got a page for remarks there if you want to maybe list out schools you tended to, things like that. So that is the CAT Form 114. All right, go back over to the slides. Any questions so far on the, the two main forms? All right. Now we're gonna talk about the tracks and training materials. So like I said, I built this for my squadron. And so I have my squadron's ES site that covers a lot of the uh, information that beginners are gonna need. After we go through that, we'll go look at the uh, national training website. All right. So 
put more, our website in there. Okay, so from the il205.cap.gov website, go to the missions, select emergency services. And I start out with getting started. You've got to have a uniform. You have to have your general emergency services complete, which is taking your CAP test 116 and having your curry or level one for a senior member. That's how you get started. Now there's several, a couple different tracks you can go depending on what your interests are. The ground search track, that is urban direction finding, which is typically looking for aircraft beacons, usually on airfields. Ground team member takes those um, direction finding skills and adds in missing person search and some woodmanship skills. These two tracks require you to acquire and maintain equipment, so camping type gear. And you have to also have um, several texts with you. So we have the ground team member leader reference text and the ground urban direction finding team member task guide. Those are your two main sources of information for ground and urban direction finding. All right, so if you're just starting out, I have a list of things that a, a trainee has to have. Once you're fully qualified, there's a more extensive list of gear you're required to have, but this is the start. So uniform, pad and pencil, your cap ID, so one-on-one -on -one card, first aid card. Remember your cap ID card, that's part of your uniform. Uh, don't forget that. You wanna have a watch, some sort of utility tool, a day pack, first aid kit, matches, a chem light, socks, flashlight, toilet paper, leather work gloves, cell phone. This used to say quarters for a pay phone, but good luck finding one of those. So I changed it to say cell phone. Uh, and two meals. So taking into account, you're probably not gonna have time to stop and build a fire. So this two meals could possibly just include money for McDonald's or whatever unhealthy place you stop along the way. Um, or get some of those meals, you just dump the water in and it uh, heats up. Those are usually pretty good tossing your day back. And then a coat appropriate for the weather and any rain gear. Two quarts of wet, uh, water minimum. Um, we used to always walk around in army web gear with our two one quart canteens. Nowadays, pretty much everyone's rocking a uh, camelback and it is definitely easier to go that way. All right, so those two tracks, urban direction finding and ground team, they require you to take cap test 117 part one. So last week we talked about that. Um, it's in the same location as CAP test 116. And I have the path here. So go to e-services, go to the menu in the top left, learning management system, access, go to the course catalog, except emergency from the drop down menu. If you haven't done anything yet, there should be four options, CAP test 116 and then 117 parts one, two, and three. Those are the items under emergency, emergency drop down. Does anyone need me to walk them through that? that missed it on Monday. Okay, nothing heard, we'll press on. All right, mission base. You start off mission base as a mission staff assistant. These are important members of the mission base team. They are the backbone of the mission base. Everyone starts as an MSA. They uh, assist upper level staff with data entry. Uh, it's pretty hard if you're the ground team or ground branch director or incident commander, air branch director, if you're constantly trying to enter data into e-services. It's a lot easier if you have a uh, mission staff assistant to help you with that while you work on the planning. It's entry level qualification. It's pretty simple. It only has six tasks to accomplish, only one to become a trainee. And this takes CAP test 117 part three. All right, the only gear you need for this, water bottle, food, your own laptop if you want. Usually makes it easier if you bring your own. Another entry level position for mission base, and this could also be a field position too, is the um, mission radio operator. So you have to have completed the introductory communications user training known as ICUT. We're gonna be doing that on Friday. So once you're done with that, you also take CAT one, test uh, 117 part three. Uh, for ICUT training, this one is under the communications catalog under Ac in Access. It's important to note that once you take the online portion, you have 180 days from that to do the hands-on training. And for step-by-step -step guides, if you stay on my website and scroll back to the top, 
I have a how to complete eye cut step-by-step um, -step guide, basically screenshots for every step of the way. I also have how to complete journal yes, um, the slideshow we just started with, and then the obstacles for beginners, which we're going to talk about next. My extended uh, 114, and then the flight line marshalling that I did last night for those of you that joined us then. All right, these tasks are in the mission-based task guide, and there's a link there for that, and I'll show you where those are all located a little bit. Flight line marshaller, if you like to do flight line operations, this is where you start. Work on the flight line, you help fuel the aircraft, park the aircraft, chalk them. It's important here to dress appropriately for the forecast weather. You know, it could be cold and windy or hot and sunny, so dress appropriately. That's the flight line. So far, all of these tracks require eye cut, basic first aid, independent study 100, and independent study 700. These are the introduction to an incident command system and the introduction to the National Incident Management System. Those are two courses on the FEMA website. I have a link to that here, training.fema.gov. Uh, this is the first time taking a course, you need to register and get a FEMA student ID. Don't lose that. That's how you log into the website and get proof or, or get your uh, completion certificates. And once you take those courses, you should get an email from FEMA with your certificates. You're going to want to save those. One, save them on your own hard drive somewhere. They need to upload those to ops calls, and we'll cover that later. You also need to upload proof of your first aid training. All right, if you're over 18, you can work on air crew tracks. Fishing scanner is the entry level position. You have to have general emergency services done, be 18 year older, and take CAP test 117 part two, IS 100 and 700. It's recommended you have a, an aviation headset. Um, some pilots have an extra they carry around. I, I know I carry an extra one, but you can't count on that. So if you're gonna get into air crew, it's worthwhile to invest in buying your own headset. So someone asked the question if the first aid course is on access. No, first aid, that is on you to go out and find. Um, hopefully your health services officer or your ES officer will be able to coordinate a uh, course for the squadron. But oftentimes you have to go out to find a Red Cross course, something like that. The online only courses um, are not acceptable. You have to actually have a hands-on portion for uh, first aid. So that's in the 60-3, so don't go out and just take it online only, it won't count. There are some blended options any of the Red Cross is doing. It's a little bit cheaper than the full in-person where you can go do some online stuff and then go do the hands-on, essentially the testing. All right, so you have the air crew and flight line task guide is what you're gonna look at for your air crew positions. And the, the actual training materials themselves are located in the Mission Air Crew School under NISA. Cool thing is, once you get qualified for air crew, you get to wear a flight suit. And everyone wants to be a pilot, right? It's the greatest job in the world, so. All right, new pilot members coming on board. You would start off as a transport mission pilot. So Air Patrol has finally collected all the pilot information into one handy little booklet. It's the uh, pilot onboarding information. They have a separate website dedicated to it and everything. Uh, you need 50 hours of cross country time, 100 hours pilot and command time in order to get qualified as a transport mission pilot. And then you also have to take um, IS 100 and 700. Just coming online relatively recently is the small unmanned aerial system operations. So the SUAS technician and mission pilot. If you have your FAA part 107 remote pilot certification, then you can start training to be a SUAS mission pilot. You need to get a check ride show you've got four hours of pilot in command and those materials are available on the cap suas operations page and we'll cover that later okay. let me break in sure. for a second um with uh, the suas um i just took that training that was given by so a couple of uh members from delaware wing uh last last month or a couple months ago whatever it was uh, i'm now a qualified technician i can't get the pilot tech uh, trainee status yet i'm oh, sorry i'm sorry i'm a qualified technician trainee and okay. I think the pilot qualification yet because I have to do the uh, form five um, but this is something that's really really starting to be pushed by um, national and this is kind of one of those things that um, 
they are kind of really emphasizing that this is going to be the new hot um, program in the next few years. So if you're interested in this, I would recommend getting a hold of your wing and find out who your um, DOU is for this because in a few years, this is going to be one of those things that it's going to be at least what they're predicting is really big and it's going to be involved with a lot of different operations. So if you're interested in this, I would recommend you get on the ground floor of it. So, Yes, I'd also like to add that the technician does not have the 18-year-old um, age limit. So cadets, this is a great place for you to get started. Okay, and I want to cover some of the awards you can win too if you're uh, working in any service or emergency services. 10 Homeland Security sorties in any role, you get the Homeland Security ribbon. If you do five disaster relief missions and two disaster relief training courses, uh, you can earn the disaster relief ribbon. Or like a bunch of us are doing now and did over the last couple of months, participate in a mission on a presidentially declared disaster like we did for uh, COVID and you get the V device to add to your ribbon and you only have to do this the one mission. If you do uh, 10 search and rescue sorties, you get to wear the air search and rescue ribbon. And if you did it as an air crew, you get the bronze propeller added to the ribbon. Similar to the find. If you make a find, you get the plane ribbon. If you find on an air crew, you get the propeller added. So those are some of the uh, ribbons and awards you can win for uh, emergency services. Those are all outlined in CAPREG 35-5 and 39-3. All right, we're going to hop over to the national website now. So let me change screens. Uh, can someone confirm that you're seeing the education and training page for national? Okay, thanks. All right, so it's real simple to get here. You go to GoCivilWarePatrol.com, go to the emergency services section under programs, and go down to education and training. All right, right here you have links to the general emergency services materials, which is uh, the basis for my brief on Monday. You can learn about the operational risk management here. You also have links to all the uh, flight line task guides, or the aircrew and flight line task guide curriculum, the ground and urban task guide, some instant command staff information. There is a list of who can sign off on what under qualified supervisors. Basically, it's a big uh, chart that shows you, hey, if you're a GTL, you can sign off on uh, GTL, GTM, 1, 2, and 3, UDF, things like that. If you're interested in becoming a skills evaluator after you've been qualified in a position for one year, go take the skill evaluator examination. There's a link for that right here. And another link to the FEMA website to get your uh, FEMA courses done. Every once in a while, I think it's like every two years in our area, we get the uh, Inland SAR school comes around. Now we had it in Bloomington, what, two years ago? And we just had down Scott uh, last year. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds right. Um, so that's a good course if you're uh, moving up in the ranks and becoming a mission based advanced mission based staff you want to try to get that course at some point it, it is a long week and it hurts your brain but it's good information and the best part really is networking with the other um sar agencies and members that come to those courses exactly all right so let's look at a couple things in here um there is a whole page on the 406 megahertz training beacon. The, the 406 megahertz beacon is the new ELT. So it's a great page there. It talks everything about the beacon. And it's a good information. If you really want to dig, dig into it, learn about the AFRCC, um, SARSAT, and all that kind of stuff, this is where you go. All right. We also have sortie equivalency. This is what I was talking about. Shows you what mission can sign off or what specialty can sign off uh, other specialties. It's basically a big long uh, cross chart. Uh, for you pilots, here is the onboarding site. It walks you through how to get all your information uploaded into OpsQuals. 
what you need to do and the criteria for each one of the, the pilots you want to become. SUAS operations. Here's all the information. So if you're interested in that, dig into it. All right. There's one thing I was looking for here. Um, oh, here we go. Under operation support, there is an SQTR information task guides. So it lists all of the task guides in one spot. And then it has a link to every single SQTR there is. So you might want to make this one of your favorites. It's kind of a one-stop shop for all those SQTRs. And I, I don't have my other two books with me because they're in, they're in my car, but here's the one for Mission Base if everybody wants to see that. This is basically what, the t what he was talking about at the top. It's just a little kind of booklet type of thing. So it kind of has all those uh, tasks in there. So you get these off of uh, Vanguard. Uh, I don't recall how much they are anymore. I got this one a while ago. Or if you want to just print them out individually, but that could be a lot of pages. So your call. Yeah, so. I, I prefer having the paper copy, like Kirk said, because when you're out in the field, you want to reference it. Um, it's kind of a pain to haul around your iPad or phone and something to charge it, keep it charged if you're out in the field for a long time. So the paper doesn't run out of batteries. It's always the nice thing about it, as long as you keep it dry. All right. Any questions on the National ES training site and what you can find there? There's something particularly anyone's looking for that I didn't show them yet. I've got a quick question. Yes. Are, are there any partner agencies that are helping as far as discounts or whatnot for the 107 certification through the FAA? I'm not sure, Kirk. Do you have any ideas on that? Not that I've heard. You know, like I said, I know this is just a new program, so maybe in the future, but I don't, I'm don't. not aware of everything right now. Um, if you know who your wing uh, director of operations for um, unmanned systems is, maybe reach out to them. Maybe they know. But I, I, I don't honestly have a good answer for you because I'm not sure. All right. Thank you. Yeah. He's asking about training for 107. That's going on right now. Oh, is Illinois doing it right now? I forget who's doing it now. Yes, they are. I could get you a name in a couple of minutes. Uh, Gary, Gary Brown's run is the one that's a DOU for Illinois Wing. Yeah, one thing I do know is if you're already a private pilot, it's a expedited process. You don't have to go yeah. through all, this, all the training that a brand new guy would. Okay, anything else? Okay, let's move on to ops calls. All right, are you all seeing my e-services front page? Okay, thank you. All right, so from e-services, the fastest way to get to Wimmers, or sorry, we'll get that later. Uh, ops calls. I have a, a favorite. If y'all haven't set your page up to have favorites, go ahead and do that. It just makes things so much faster. But otherwise, you go to the menu, go down to operations, and then click on operations qualifications. All right, first time here. They have some instructions on how to do the uh, squitter. But I'm going to just go through and tell you. All right, so remember, anytime you see a magenta box, that is a drop-down menu, so you're going to clip on, click on that again, and we'll get to the one-on-one card. So you either enter your last, last name, first name, or your cap ID. All right, and there is my one-on-one card. So if you get here and you don't have your picture done already, you scroll down a little bit, there is a link to upload a cat picture. And that's where you'd upload that. And if your personal characteristics aren't correct, it also gives you a nice little link right to you, the um, your personnel section so you can upload that. Once it's all done, there's a button to click 
or a way to print it. It's going to print out this entire thing. You don't need the uh, right-hand two columns. You just need the first two. So just discard this part, fold this up. Um, you can do laminate it, use the uh, packing tape waterproofing method, or just make it, make it sturdy, make it safe so it does, uh, doesn't wash away. Um, all right, so important things here. The view and upload documents. I want to walk everyone through how to do this. Because a lot, a lot of your um, courses that you take, like first aid, your, your FEMA courses, you need to prove to your evaluator that you did them, and you do that by uploading the certificate. So you go to View Upload Documents. You have a couple different tabs here. It de mine defaults to Merge Services. You've got one for Pilot, one for Driver's License, and then one for Com. Um, are there, are there any communicators online that can uh, tell me what you put in the comm section? I've never used that one. Uh, there's not really too much you would put in there. Um, that would be useful to most people. All right. We'll move on. So for most of us here, looking at emergency services. So there's a drop-down box right below that says, what would you like to upload? You open that, you've got lots of options. Mostly you're looking at your independent study or ICS courses. So let's say we're doing ICS 100. You would click on that, go choose your file wherever you have it saved at, and then upload it. And it's going to show up in here as ICS 100, 200, 700, 800, whatever. Um, I use this to upload other random things too that you need to have a bit access to. So I have my SAR Tech 3 certificate. I have my um, SAR management course certificate in here. Heck, I even put my participation for conferences in here. So it's a great way to save stuff that you need. All right, your first aid also goes in here. So we'll go back up, scroll down to the bottom. This is where you add your first aid and your other stuff. So first aid CPR, choose your file, upload. If you're uploading other stuff just to save it there for fun, you just use other. Any questions on how to upload your certificates? It's important that you all do this because if you submit something like um, your first aid or your independent study courses, then you submit to your your uh, evaluator, they're going to deny it if they don't if they don't see these uh, documents in your file. All right, for the pilots. Lots of things to upload here. You upload your medical, your Form 70. All right, so one of the kids had a question. You, up, you upload something, but it didn't show up. Um, we'll cover that. You also need to submit the task to be approved. So the two don't talk. It's, it's not an automatic process. Back to the pilots. Upload your Form 70, your FAA certificate, flight review, your wing certificate, medical, your questionnaire. Things like that. And there's also a section over here for your Form 5s to select which aircraft it is. So C stands for Cessna. So a lot of us, it's the C-172 or the C-182. And driver's license. If you're getting your driver's license, you would upload your uh, driving record here and a copy of your driver's license. All right, any questions on the uploading? All right, let's go back to the Opsqual's drop-down menu and go to the worksheet. This is where you enter your tasks. So I just saw one cadet mentioned they didn't have their first aid signed off. So let's go to ground team three. Oh, correction there, yeah. It doesn't show on your one-on-one your one -on -one card. It is just a task for ground team and some other uh, tests. So it's not a separate thing on your one-on-one card. All right, so let's say you're starting out at ground team three. So you'll select that task. And let's see, you know what? I already have it done. So let's uh, not use me and use someone else. Someone out there give me their cap ID if they don't have ground team three done already. All right, thank you. No 
Okay, Lieutenant Moritz. All right, has General ES you got approval for the prerequisites? So it's important to go in order, and you know, a lot of times we're, we're bad about uh, getting things done in proper order. But you're supposed to start first off, your commander has to approve you to start training. So in this case, our commander did a little bit out of order because he signed off on the completing on the family prep when she's not done with the family prep yet. So try, try to go in order. It's really easy to get your, your data input. Let's say, so Lieutenant Morris did the prepare ground team individual equipment task. All you do is you go select the date, put in the evaluator. All right. Uh, yeah, someone else probably did it for you. Some people get um, excited and just go in and start approving people things without really knowing what they're doing. So. That's why you're having this class, so you know how to do it properly. All right, the evaluator. You can search the evaluator by, once again, cap ID or last name, first name. So, put myself in. You know what? Just to show you something, I'll put my wife in. All right, so my wife is not an evaluator for Ground Team 3. So, when you put someone in who can't evaluate, you get this pop-up warning saying, hey, they cannot be your evaluator. Basically, go back and pick something else. So if, for instance, you wanted to get mission safety officer, mission staff assistant, or FASC, then yes, you could use my wife, but can't. So let's use me. Yeah. And that's what we were talking about on Monday. The system used to let you do that. Um, so people kind of started punching a lot of buttons and they weren't supposed to and things got a little messed up. That's good they had that kind of check and balance in there now. It used to be a, a major pain to kind of get that stuff corrected. And it's usually helpful to let the evaluator know you are using them. Um, if I was teaching a large class, I may not you know, know everyone that's in the class. Um, if we started to get a bunch of people signing off, I may forget who I'm signing off. So just give me a heads up. Hey, you're my evaluator. Like, okay, got it. So what this does, it, if there is a date in the completed block, that means that that person you selected can sign you off. So let's go down to ground team three. So yes, I have a date there. I am allowed to evaluate and sign off ground team three tasks. Some of these, like the courses, they don't have a date. They're not anything that needs to evaluate. You just input them. And if the certificate's there, it's good. Any questions on selecting your evaluator? All right. Next up, you're going to want to put in the mission number. This helps you also keep track of your missions if you're trying to get an air search or um, an air search ribbon or ground search ribbon. All right. Once you've done that, you use the submit button at the lower left to submit that. If you were doing a bunch of these, what you could do, here, I'll just. Here's the mission number. All right, this uh, certificate ID in the next one, this doesn't apply for most tasks. You could put your certificate in if you had like a FEMA course or something like that, but it's really not necessary. Let's say Lieutenant uh, Moritz had finished the rest of these tasks and wanted to didn't feel like inputting all the information again. All you do is go through, check the boxes, and then go back to the first one and hit this little box in the upper right-hand corner. That's the copy box. It would copy that same information all the way to the other one, so you don't have to put it put it in by hand. Is that clear? Any questions on that? All right. We uncheck that. All right. So ideally, you go through and you finish your family prep training. And like I mentioned on Monday, once family prep, prep training is done, then you show up as a trainee. So until all this is done, Lieutenant Moritz won't be a trainee for Ground Team 3. Then you move on to your advanced training. This is where your independent study courses, your first aid, and all that stuff comes in. So you complete those. You have ICUT, and then you have to do exercise participation for two different uh, missions. It could be the same mission if you're doing different sorties, too. So you don't have to necessarily wait a month between missions. If it's a multi-day mission or you're doing multiple sorties, you use different sorties for this. 
All right, ground team three, you have cap test 117 part one. That's the test that goes with that. So once all this is filled out and you hit submit, it'll go through the ES chain for approval. It'll start with the squadron ES officer, move up to the group and then the wing. And at any point along the way, someone could uh, reject it if they saw something that was wrong. Is there something that you want me to look up? No, I'll do it. It's, okay. Yeah. So, somebody said they uh, took the 116, but it's not showing up. But I'll look into it. You, you keep going. Okay. All right. Let's back up here real quick. I'll show you a neat little trick that not everyone knows. It's a great uh, way to find information in Silver Air Patrol. This box up here is the Silver Air Patrol Worldwide Search Directory. So, uh, let's see. Someone from Illinois, that's not from Illinois Wing, give me their cap ID or name. All right, Tenant, is it Fersh's? We will look you up. All right, so I didn't even have to put his cap ID in. He has a unique last name and he is the only one in cap. So I just typed in his last name, hit enter, and brought up all of his information. Now, it defaults to what I was just at. So since I was looking at ground team level three before, it brings up his. So it shows that he's a trainee because he has all the fan prep tasks done and his commander signed that off. He just has to do a couple other tasks and one more mission, then he's good. But the real nice thing about this is you go back to one-on-one card. Now it shows his one-on-one -on -one card, but you go click this little uh, folder to the right of his name and you can find inf some information about him. Uh, find out the email address, their unit cap ID, what their uh, duties are, and some of the training they've done. If they're a senior member, they'd have all their specialty tracks, things like that. It's a great way to find information on people if you're trying to uh, coordinate and collaborate. You can also look up entire units. So let's see. So when I just start typing GLRIL, it pulls up a list of um, some of the Illinois wing units. It doesn't give you all of them because it's truncated, but if I just do start typing a couple other numbers, it shortens down the list. So these are all the ones that start with zero. So I can look up an entire group. So I'm in group one. I can pull up all the group one. This says, hey, there's 400. And oh, wait, no, it didn't. It didn't select it. There are only four people directly assigned to group one. If I was trying to find out a squadron's name, like I just knew their charter number, I could use this same function and find out the squadron name. Um, I could look up the entire wing headquarters if I wanted to, look up different group headquarters, or just pick a squadron. So apparently all of Springfield is on here, so I'll look you all up. So you've got 45 people in the Springfield squadron. You can go through and look look through all of them. Um, I sometimes use this to figure out who is has what job, especially if it's out of state and I can't pull a duty report. I just have to do it the hard way. Click on each name, go look at the box, and figure out who it is until I find the ES officer, the commander, DCC, whoever it is I'm looking for. It's a pain in the butt, but you have to sometimes. Yeah, it's a useful tool. Yeah. Any questions on this? It's also about the only way you can find any information on any of the overseas squadrons because they hide their stuff pretty well. So I had a cat that piece her family PCS to Wiesbaden, Germany. It took forever to find any information about the Wiesbaden flight because they don't officially exist. They're a unlicensed offshoot of Framstein. So they only exist because she told me they existed and I tracked them down. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Okay, let's see. Let me check my slideshow and see what else I want to talk about there. So we've uploaded documents. We talked about submitting the task for approval. 
learn how to search through e-services to find people. All right. Well, that's about all I had planned. And you know what? Let's go back and look at everything in the obstacles menu while we're here. So if you're trying to just print out some blank worksheets, this is where you would go. Print blank worksheets and just pick whatever it is you're interested in. And it gives it to you without, uh, I'll download it for me. Okay. It gives you to it without any other stuff put in. So if you're trying to maybe plan a class, figure out what all the tasks are. If you, if you pick some person that has all the stuff done or is already qualified, it will only show you the advanced tasks. So that's probably important for you to understand. So, oops, uh, back up. So for instance, if I pull up something I'm already qualified in, it only shows you the tasks you have to re-qualify. And this is probably important for everyone to understand too. You've got three years to regain your qualification once you're qualified in a task. So this shows that in order for me to renew my flight line marshaler before 31 January 22, I have to go complete the tasks that aren't uh, filled out. So I think my first date expired, I gotta go get another one. Um, now that N NASAR requires we're in his first aid, I gotta find one of those courses, so yay. And then I have to do one more mission. So as you can tell, it's a lot easier to keep up with your, your specialties than let one expire, because if it expires, you have to go back through and do everything again. So stay on top of stuff. If you're out there doing a task, don't wait till the end of three years to get it signed off. Get it signed off as you do it. So this essentially be a rolling, um, List and you won't ever, it'll keep on resetting your expiration as you do tasks. And you kind of alluded to it at the start of this. Also, don't try to get every qualification under the sun at the same time because they're all going to expire at the same time and it's going to be a pain in the butt to get them all back up to speed. So yes. don't focus on little groups at a time, two or three, work on those, maybe a couple years online, another two or three because I think I've people that have done that. It's been a major challenge to get everything back up to speed in that time frame. So. Yep. All right. So there was a question about uh, PODC. I will go show you how to do that one. All right. Back to SUTR entry worksheet. You go to PODC and then you would just input the date and hit submit. If you had uploaded the certificate, um, it would go through the chain that people would see it and approve it. So there's a certificate for that. Let's see. You would go to, I don't think that one is listed under separately. I'm not sure. No, it is not. So that's one you would just select under other to input. And let's see, it's in here somewhere. Yep, there you go. PODC. So whenever I submitted that, it um, the evaluator could see, yep, it's there. Uh, I guess they just changed the rules in this recently. We're taking the IS-26 independent study course it is all you need to. That's all I ever did for it, and I got approved years ago. So it's one of those things National may have some rule out there on what the requirements are, but they haven't actually told anyone. So whoever approved it didn't know the rules just like I didn't know the rules. But now all you do is take the course and upload it, and you're good. Yeah, I think they get the key going back and forth, so. Yeah. Who knows? Anyway, for those that don't know, PODC, point distribution, that is, is, we used that a lot in the hurricanes, and that's originally why I got this in, in the 2018 hurricane season. Um, basically passing out food and water at uh, centers that people drive up. So, And we started looking at it for the COVID stuff, too, especially those working in the uh, food warehouses. Um, it's useful knowledge to have. All right, let's go back and see what else we need to talk about here. Ah, skill evaluator. Uh, once you have the, once you've been in a specialty for a year, you can go and have taken the skill evaluator quiz. You can go have someone uh, submit. You can't submit yourself, so someone else has to do this for you. There's a couple ways you can do this. You could submit all eligible or go through and click um, 
or select each one of these. So, all right, I've already got everything knocked out that I can get. Let's get someone who, let's pick a random person. All right, give me a uh, new person out there. Five, nine, five, seven, 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 seven. 64801, okay. All right, we've got a kid at Airman here. He can't be a skill evaluator because he hasn't taken the test and hasn't had anything for a year. So if you look at his qualifications, you can see what cadet has. You've got GES, just got that, and that's it. So this person can't be an evaluator. All right, let's 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 try someone else. 19907. Okay, then diary still don't have anything. Let's give me someone who has has a qualification. You want to just put me in? Sure. Yeah, or, or, Dang, there we go. Zane probably has something. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Perfect. Oh, oh so I can submit you for Dart if you want me to. You just do it right now. So what you see is, uh, he's a great example. Um, if you're, he is eligible for something, there's boxes along the left-hand side that I can select. If he isn't eligible for something, there'll be a little bit of a red line saying, he's not current, so he hasn't had ground team one. Um, oh, he's not current. He got qualified originally in 16, but he is no longer current. So it'll, it'll tell you what you can and can't do. If for some reason you want them to just have a temporary uh, evaluator status, you go ahead and click yes. I've never done that before, but depending on the circumstances, you may want to do that. So he is a current on flight line marshaler. He's taken the skill evaluator exam. So we always need people to evaluate flight line marshaling because there's not a whole lot of people go into that, that field. So more evaluators, the better. One of the few cadets to get DART qualified, DART U and DART O, so good job there. So all you do is you check the boxes, go down to the bottom and click Submit. And it should work. All right, what am I missing? Any ideas, Kirk? Won't let me do it. It should. I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe. Do all the access, maybe. Anyway, maybe you can try it. But so, if yeah. someone submitted him for it, and for whatever reason, his commander or the ES staff said, "You know what? He pencil whipped all that. He's not really qualified. We're going to deny it." So, it could be denied after you someone submits you for it. So, just keep that in mind. All right. I will clear that then. Maybe someone else can try that for me in his squadron, Fox Valley. All right. Any questions on the skill evaluator part? All right. There are quirks out there, and sometimes I just don't know why things don't work. So, I, I don't. It should have worked in my mind. All right, uh, for the aircrew folks, this is probably a good one uh, to look at. So click on the what do I need section and select what qualification. So if you're a brand new person coming in and you wanna, you're just starting out, so you wanna be a VFR pilot. Click that, it tells you what all you have and don't have. Okay, so everyone congratulate uh, Cadet Zhang for just passing his private pilot check ride. So that is still shows as pending for him. And let's see, is physic military physical as pending? 
And that, that's something pretty cool though. Those of us that are on the military aviators, our annual physical can count for our medical. So we just keep on uploading that at the class three physical. So let's do a flight review at some point, get a form five. Um, you would have your initial statement on seeing because then just go ahead and do that. You just click that and basically check I agree, then that goes in there. Go ahead, take your test. Do your form five. Done ground handling already. Good job. Uh, make sure you take the aircraft professionalism course. This is a new requirement. Um, I ran into this when um, one of our, our group commander actually, it said he was about to expire, even though he we'd all been pushed out until I think September. And it's because he hadn't taken the new course yet. So make sure everyone goes and takes that. So let's see. Yeah, there's all sorts of things on here. Uh, everything pilot related, check pilots for all the airframes, mission check pilots, mission pilot, instrument pilot, SUAS, instructor pilot, all those things are in there. So if you're working toward one of those, click that and it'll tell you what you need to get that qualification. Now let's look at the prerequisites. All right, another place you can get everything knocked out. All right, so he's working already. Got the statement of understanding done. Um, let's see. Now you just gotta fly to get those 100 hours. Fly all the time, right? If you wanted to do be an orientation pilot, you also have to take a uh, orientation pilot exam. Need a lot more hours for those though. If you're doing G1000, there's different G1000 training you have to do. Tow pilot, even more hours, lots of toes. Even more for a trainer. And then winch. I know nothing about towing, so just know the stuff is there. All right. If you're in the contract, you can enter your qualifications there. Now, this is an important one here, ratings, awards, and badges. So once you are generally emergency services qualified and you earn one other specialty, that qualifies you for the, um, or is it? The emergency services patch. So you should have this already. Go in and submit yourself for that. You're overdue. Uh, once you get a ground team member, you can get the ground team badge. Ground team leader gets you the senior ground team badge and ground branch director gets you the master ground team badge. For senior members, if you're in the emergency services track, once you get technician, you get the uh, basic badge senior and master as you progress. Same thing for incident commander. Uh, for the pilots, if you get a um, cap pilot to sign off on your solo, you can get a solo rating right off the bat, even without even doing a form five. And then once you take your form five, you can get a pilot rating. So we have a member of my squadron, brand new private pilot, got a form five. So he has a cap pilot rating but he doesn't have anywhere near the number of hours since he's a brand new pilot to become a transport mission pilot. So he still shows in your database as a cap pilot. And it's important that you new pilots out there do this because that way it lets the um, members planning at the wing and group know who their future potential uh, transport and mission pilots are. So that gets you in the books as a cap pilot. All right, and if you wanted to, you could you could put your instrument experience, take off some landings for the pilots in here. You could put your mission availability, letting uh, people know what days of the week, what times you're available. And you also upload your driver's license information here. This is an important one, so let's see. Good, you do have your license. You have to be 18 years old. You have, have to have uploaded your driving record, your driver's license. It has to have the date in there, so you're about to expire. And it lists the vehicles you're allowed to drive. So this is how you do this. And there's some instructions there if you uh, forget. But typically, um, I leave this to my logistics officer to sign off. That way he makes sure everyone knows the rules, uh, you know, when to, prop when to use the fuel card, things like that. It, uh, nothing ticks off Colonel Taylor more than people using the fuel card at the wrong time. So you'll get an email from him if you do it wrong. 
or uh, wing one thing about that. Um, in Illinois wing, Colonel Taylor says the policy is that you have to be 21 or older in order to have a driver's license. Uh, so all of you could see that I was not approved and uh, that is the reason. So if you're interested in that, just keep that in mind. Yeah, and that policy may be different um, for other wings. I don't know the transportation regulation um, that thoroughly, so I'm not sure if it's a cap or just Illinois. All right, uh, let's see. So that's ops calls. There's some other things in there you can dig into if you get more advanced. Um, but right now I wanted to go through Wimmers and that'll be about the last thing. I'm not gonna go too in depth into Wimmers. I just wanna make sure you all know how to sign in. Like I talked about on Monday, Wimmers is the de facto sign in for Silver Patrol. So you could either go to the menu, go to operations and then click on Wimmers underneath obstacles. Or the fastest thing is just scroll all the way to the bottom of your main e-services page, and it is the link just under e-services again. So click that. And depending on how you have your stuff set up, it'll pull a page like this. So I have my filter set up to show me Great Lakes region, Illinois, Missouri, and North Central region, because that's the region that Missouri's in. I'm looking at the open and pending uh, missions. All right, we had a, uh, Kirk, you want to handle his question in the chat? No problem. All right, so these are the filters I have set. There's, you can have filters for wherever you want, whichever wing you want, whatever region. Uh, just important to remember, this is going to bring up whatever you saved last. Uh, use control to select multiple missions or multiple wings. You could do a date range. You could look for a particular mission number, mission type. You could also just search by yourself. So if you want to see whatever you're in, just type in your mission number or your cap ID. And it'll pull up everything that I am in on under those uh, filters. So, oh, let's see. That's not accurate because that's not all just me. Oh, you have to hit search. There we go. That's the only things I'm logged into right now that it's showing, which is odd because I know I'm in more than that. Oh, <laughs> like I said, I fooled myself. It selected all those uh, random things that I clicked on, and I was in Arkansas last year. I did some flying while I was TDY there. So I have to go reselect my uh, local agencies Great Lakes region, Illinois, Missouri. Oh, I missed it. NCR search. Oh, dang it. Got to reselect everything because now it gave me everything open and pending. I guess it's good you're seeing this because it understands how touchy this is. You have to make sure you go through everything, all the settings that you want before you click search. All right, so I have my two regions, two wings, open and pending, and that's gonna be good enough for me right now. So hit search. Brings me back to that page, type in my cap ID again, and then search again. All right, that's everything I've done recently. So if, you, if you're trying to, if you can't, if you don't keep track of your stuff on the 114, cap form 114, this is another way to figure out what you've done. But once again, this only goes back as far as when Wimmers came online, which is not that long ago. All right, let's say I want to go to a mission to sign in. All right, let's go to this mission, which isn't going to happen now because we keep getting pushed back. <laughs> So you select your mission. There's different ways you could select the mission. You could search for it by like, I, when I create mine, I label them group one in the title. 
if I can search for everything that's group one. Those are all the missions we've done. You could, if you're doing Dart, there's a couple missions labeled Dart. You type that in, find them that way. There are some calm missions. You could type them in like that. This is something that um, Missouri does that I like because I check into the St. Louis net. They have a separate mission number for check-ins. You just go in whenever you check into the net and log in on the calm log. Like, hey, I checked in today. So it's a great way to track everyone. So let's go back to one of mine that I can play with without ruining anything. All color coded. So there's some canceled ones. That's orange, gray means it's a closed one. Yellow is pending and green is open. All right, so here's the mission. You want to go with log in. So you're gonna to go to the, uh, there's lots of places you can do it. Finance admin is one place. Go to sign in, sign out. I'm gonna be the IC of this mission if it ever goes, so I'm already signed in. All you do is sign in new personnel, type in your CAP ID. Select the staff assignment. Make sure the information there is right. If you, yep, okay, I already have some selected, so I would say starting at Scott Capri Squadron, you could add to personal equipment if you wanted to. And click sign in. And you just keep on doing that. There's also a um, bulk entry. Just enter a bunch of CAP IDs and the non-CAP member. Some other information to enter for those people. So if, for instance, on the, uh, you notice there was a first aid mission that the wing has for each group. Um, if we had a FEMA instructor or, a, or I mean a Red Cross instructor, we could add that person to the mission using this uh, method. So that's how you sign into a mission. Any questions on that? Right. There's a couple other locations where sign in is. Let's see, you've got it's under planning, and I believe it's under support. No, so uh, planning and finance and admin. That's where the sign in sign out portion is. You can also sign in your vehicles, so or your aircraft for that matter. Go over to aircraft and sign in a new aircraft. It's corporate. Most we're, we're mostly flying only corporate aircraft. Say yes, select the wing that it's from, and let's go polar aircraft. This is a fast way to figure out where, what aircraft Illinois wing has is by using this. All right, so that's aircraft. Vehicles is very much the same. Sign in a new vehicle. Is it corporate? We'll say yes. And I go and find our vehicle and add that. It's important that you sign in a vehicle, especially if you're going to do a ground sortie going to the mission base. Because when you all sign in, you want to sign in the vehicle and the personnel onto that ground sortie to the mission. That way it accounts for everyone should something happen. So if it wasn't a corporate vehicle, I mentioned this earlier, the incident commander can authorize uh, members to use their personally owned vehicles, POVs, to go to the mission. They could even maybe authorize them to use them on the mission. In order to do that, you would have to... Um, Click no for the corporate vehicle part. Next question is, is this available for mission use? So if you wanted to make your vehicle available, um, it might be someone else besides you driving it, but uh, you could say yes. If it's just you driving it to the mission, you're saying, no, I don't want anyone else to use it. I'm just driving it here and home, say no. So you would upload the wing commander approval, the wing commander or instant commander approval. Uh, when I'm doing a training mission, I will usually Put that memo in the files of the mission. That way people can sign in, go pull that file down and add it to their um, sign in. Put all your information in for the vehicle. If you happen to have a radio in it, go ahead and mark that. And then wherever you're departing from, click sign in. So you may be asking, how do I add those other facilities? Oh, let's see, where's it at? Mission facilities under command. Click that. And you see I put the group one squadrons in there. It would add a facility, the name, what kind of facility. 
Remember we talked about for the basic instant command system stuff on Monday. Uh, these are the options we have, instant base, command post, comm center, or a staging area. So a lot of times for, for our training, I will mark our squadrons as a staging area because that's where we would depart from to go to the training area. The location, you either put the uh, four-letter ICAO airport identifier, or if it's a town, just type in the town. Someone that's in charge of that uh, location, typically a squadron commander, uh, put their email, phone number, and all that kind of stuff. Now, this one has radio communications available because I already built a comm plan. So, say CC1 or in our area, St. Louis Repeater. Now, I would add this as a new facility. The channel plan, real simple. You just select what channels, their name, and what they're used for. So, add a channel. Just toss it in there. You could add in HF channels if you're going to use, you know, GLC or something like that or whichever repeater was nearby, you wouldn't, might want to type that in. All right, so channel plan, um, facilities, signing in and out, aircraft, people, and vehicles. One of the other things you may use is the unit log or the comm log. So if you are a mission staff assistant or a mission radio operator, you're probably going to be using these. The unit log essentially is a running log of everything that is going on. So instead of taking notes on a piece of paper, then losing it later on, you just type it all in Wimmers. You don't have to upload anything later. So across the bottom here, there's some check boxes. Um, that way you can track who you want to look at. So if you're only working with the um, ground branch director, you may not necessarily care what the other sections are doing. So you could uncheck those. So you type in your activity, your note, who it's for, or from, put that person's name, the mission number. If it's for a sortie, you would select the sortie and put the time and the mission facility if that's loaded in there. It's important to note that this times out. I don't know exactly what the timeout um, period is, but if you get sidetracked where you're typing a note and you go to hit submit, it won't submit. So if you've been away for a little bit, just go ahead and cut and paste your note so you can copy it into your new one and cut, cut and paste it back in. So you'd hit submit, yes. Uh, there's a trick for that though to keep it from timing out. If you go to status board, open it up to a uh, like a new tab, it'll keep open so it doesn't time out. Okay. Oh, yeah. good. So I learned something. Thank you. Yep. That is the unit log. That's typically going to be the MSAs uh, running that. If you're working with the comm unit, you're going to want to have the comm log open. This is where you're going to have all your radio checks, your in and out of blocks, up in and out of grid. Uh, checkpoints for the uh, ground teams. Once again, you put the call sign, the channel reference, uh, which sortie it's for, and mission type. There's a whole bunch of mission types you can select here. You can see those arrival time, departure time, uh, when you first get a bearing on the beacon, when you first hear the beacon, when you've silenced it, ETA objectives confirmed and located, just general ops checks and position reports, uh, radio checks, and time in and out of area. So this position report, you can do it by decimal degrees or degrees decimal minutes, or you could just pick a landmark. So different ways to identify yourself. Nowadays, most of us have ready access to a GPS so we can pass our coordinates. This is a matter of understanding that these are the two um, types or setups of coordinates that the mission base can enter. So decimal degrees or degrees decimal minutes. So make sure your GPS is formatted for those uh, options. And you need to ask before you leave, because I've been on plenty of missions where everybody was doing their own thing. There was no communication, and then coordinates were coming in. They're all different. So you need to ask before you go out the door, how are we doing this? And that is something the ground and air branch directors should be briefing their ground and air crews as they're departing. What type of format are we using? It's very important you're all on the same page. And, and uh, again, same thing. I've seen ground team use one and air crew use the other one because the two directors didn't talk to each other. So that's why everybody's got to be on the same page for that. Otherwise, it's going to create a mess. Yep. Things to remember when you all get further advanced or on the air and ground branch staff. All right. Um, I think that's really everyone, anything you need to know for basic stuff. 
just one other thing. If there are any of the critical items you hadn't read yet, um, that would show up when you first logged in saying, hey, you have to read this before you move on. So for instance, you can see some of the critical items that have been listed. There hasn't been anything for a while. Let's see, the last one was back in April. Basically said, hey, due to COVID, we're postponing non-mission essential operations. And like I said, you can't proceed until you've read these. And that'll basically pop up when you first open Wimmers. It'll pop up in a box that says you have to read this. Otherwise, you can push all the buttons you want, but it won't go away until you click approved or read, or I don't remember exactly what it says. Yep. Yeah. All right. One final step. Once you are done with the mission, make sure you go and sign out. So we'll sign my wife out of this. There you go. So one of the things I st started doing in group one is anytime we have an exercise, I go and create a um, participation letter for everyone to put in their files. And how I do that is I go to the, once we're all done and signed out, I go to the signed out members and I export that list to Excel. I just adjust those uh, columns and essentially cut and paste that into a Word document saying, hey, a little blur, but this is what we did. This is the mission number. These are all the people who participated and these are their jobs. I send it out to everyone, put it in their files, and it's a great way to uh, keep track of what you've been doing. All right, any questions on Wimmers? Wimmers for the beginner. All right, and you can, if you're leaving your house to go to the squadron to leave for a mission or a training exercise, you can actually log into the mission before you even leave your house. So the, if you all remember, or maybe you haven't got this yet, but the phone alert one of the things the alert is supposed to tell you is what the mission number is. So before you leave your house, you could take that mission number, go into Wimmers, log into the mission as you know, ground team member, UDF member, you know, whatever. So that's one of those tasks you'll have to do. All right. That is all I have. Any uh, anything else you want to ask about ES here? Does everyone know how to set up these services so their front page looks similar to mine? Any questions on that? Okay. First off, we've got time, so I might as well talk about this. It's good for everyone to know. Your name is where you get your profile information from. Click on that. Under my account, there's this is how you update all your characteristics. So if for some reason um, you your membership went through and whoever approved it wasn't paying attention, you had nothing for your height and weight, hair color, eye color, all that stuff, you can go back in here and fix it. Um, especially important later on when you're applying for cadet uh, special activities, they pull this information um, in to make sure you get the right t-shirt size and all that kind of stuff. All right, uh, so adjust your contacts. Um, a lot of time, and this is an important one in Illinois Wing particularly, uh, we all have an Illinois Wing email address. It's uh, associated with Google, but it's an ilwing.cap.gov. When you first join, obviously you don't have this. Once you've joined and established that email, make sure you go back into your contacts and add that email so that you're getting your CAP emails to the CAP email address. Try and keep your CAP and your personal stuff separate. You'll get a ton of CAP emails and this get lost. All right, um, if you have a security clearance, you can go ahead and enter that information there. Um, you can change your PIN right here if you need to. Do your auto renewal. I, I caution people on this. I got caught with this when I was deployed to Africa and it auto renewed and it didn't work. So of course it was on a weekend and I had to get on my cell phone and pay the exorbitant fees to call from Djibouti to Maxwell to try to renew while being on hold for an hour. So yeah, that was fun. So I don't exactly trust this feature, but it's there. Um, your favorite applications. So this just shows you what your favorites are. You just go on the favorites and click plus and this whole page is all the things you could have as your favorites, kind of like shortcuts. So you just click on it and it makes it a favorite. Go back to the main page and it shows you what you've got. So all these little widgets here, they don't show up automatically. You have to manage your widgets, which is down at the bottom. Manage my widgets. So I already have them all. I could remove some of them if I didn't like them anymore. Uh, if you didn't have these, you click Add Widget and just select one of the two. So if you've got approvals and validations, most of the 
beginners aren't going to need this. If you get into ES staff, you're going to want this because it'll tell you when you have people with pending uh, obstacles validations waiting for you. Statistics. This is just fun. You can look back and see how your squadron has grown. And the news. This is sometimes useful. It lets you know when there's a new publication out or a new change to e-services. E the commanders, this is important. It shows you your chain of command right there. So this is something you all should know who your bosses are. And like I said, your favorite apps. It's a great way to bunch a bunch of shortcuts there. One other thing I want everyone to understand here is the service ribbon. So you know earlier I showed you um, how you can earn some ribbons for emergency services. There's lots of ribbons you can earn and not all of them are automatically reflected in your e-services account. This is how you fix that. When this app first came out, it used to allow the personnel officer to input them for everyone else. For some reason, they turned it off, which they wouldn't have, because now it relies on each one of you to go input your ribbons. So your red service ribbon. Once you've been in for two years, you're qualified for the red service ribbon. You have to go in and submit that yourself. This is how you do it. You click add previously authorized ribbon, put in the date that it was earned, select whether it's a cadet or a senior ribbon, and you select from the drop down. So you would go to where to go, red service ribbon, and click create. What that would do, that would go to your commander to approve. And you go back and do that for every ribbon that you have. When you get clusters, you essentially just submit another ribbon. Then that way they will all show up in your e-service record with all your ribbons. Any questions on that? All right. So intro to ES and a little bit extra on e-services. Oh, uh, shoot, there is one other thing that's probably important for you all, depending on what you're interested in. Let's go back to ops, or the national ES page. There is a, um, The section that has ops seminars. Do you remember where that is? Kirk, do you remember off the top of your head? Oh, right, here you go. Uh, no. 2019 operations conference presentations under emergency services. So I didn't get to go to this, so I've gone back and watched a couple of these. So they're slideshows um, from the ops conference from last year. Some good information in here. So if you're in the ES track, Probably worthwhile going back and looking at this stuff. So once again, this is from the Ghost of Virtual page, Emergency Services, and under that, the 2019 uh, Operations Conference presentations. And they're always adding stuff in here, so it doesn't hurt to keep going back and looking what's new under the ES tab. All right, I'm going to stop presenting. And it's open to you. Any questions? All right. Well, Kirk, I guess I am done then. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, uh, if there's no uh, final questions, I'd like to thank everybody for being on tonight. Uh, especially, I think I counted five different wings on so that's not bad um so i appreciate everybody uh for, for uh hanging out with us for, for about the last uh, about an hour and a half or so um so on friday we're going to be doing the i cut with uh, cadet uh, zhang and uh, major felber um so if you're needing that or interested in that please sign in for that and then starting next week we're going to be doing um all of the actual sign offs on, and uh trainings for the um, various uh, task games, you know, ground team, uh, MSA, uh, Mr. Radio, and Scanner. So please uh, come back for those. So if there's no other questions, I think I'll um, call, it an, call it an evening for everybody. So hopefully we see most of you all back on on Friday and then the following weeks. <laughs>